um, Old Testament stories of Rebecca and her, quote, scheming with Jacob in order to get the blessing from Isaac. But uh, I um, just uh, found it fascinating uh, studying it uh, this, uh, this week, going over it a little more slowly and, uh, and, uh, and seeing some of the particulars here that I think will be uh, of interest to you. So let's, let's pray. Father, we, uh, we do pray for the uh, March of Life today, Lord, and thank you've given us a, a beautiful day out there today to do it. We pray for a, a great turnout among uh, those uh, uh, Christians and others, Lord, that hold a, a pro-life worldview that we care about the, the unborn in the womb, Lord, and we know it's a, a tragedy in this country for them and from the moms that, uh, that go through it and then suffer the, the guilt and the trauma and the consequences and the physical uh, problems, uh, higher risks of cancer, and so many of the things that are, uh, that are never discussed uh, in the media in regards to this issue. And Lord, so we just pray that uh, our voice would be heard by our governor and by the, uh, those in the legislature that, uh, Lord, uh, they would um, have a, uh, a kinder ear to uh, the issues uh, in regards to uh, pro-life and, and saving, uh, saving babies uh, in the womb, Lord. We uh, pray that uh, you'd bless our time out there, keep everyone safe, and just pray that uh, you'd watch over us, Lord. And we pray as we uh, study our passage this morning that, uh, Lord, we'd be able to walk away understanding the, the destruction of this particular family because of some decisions that were made by the husband, by the dad, by Isaac, that, uh, Lord, just had uh, uh, terrible repercussions, but uh, help us also understand uh, that there is a beautiful side to this story as well. And uh, I pray that we can see that, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So Isaac, remember, recovered from the disgrace of lying about Rebekah when he's down there in Gerar in the land of the Philistines. Uh, and as a result, uh, we got to see how the Lord was so faithful to him as he had to move and keep digging new wells uh, and, uh, in this very arid uh, uh, area where, you know, easily, at least in the summer, summer months, can be 125 degrees. So when you lose your water source, it's a very, uh, it's a very big deal. And yet every time he had to go and find another water source, another well, God kept providing. And we made the point that it was probably very difficult that first time that he moves on and names the wells contention, names another one hostility. Uh, but eventually, uh, I think probably by the fifth or sixth or seventh well, he was probably really anticipating that God was going to help him find another well because he had just been so faithful all, all along. And that's what trials do. They, we say they can make us bitter or better. And uh, in this case, they were making him better and more, more trustworthy. He then has a, a, a bit of time that is expired. Uh, I'll try to give you his approximate age as we get to this passage, but some time has gone by before we hit this chapter. We find that he's, he's blind. Uh, he's old enough. You know, we read it and it sounds like he's about ready to die, but he doesn't die for several more decades but he's old enough to realize it's that time to bless his sons, pronounce this blessing on them. And remember, God prophetically spoke to Rebekah early on, saying that the older will serve the younger. In other words, Jacob, the younger, will get the Abrahamic uh, blessing, uh, the promises of, uh, of blessing the land as well as the Messiah would come through him and so forth. So when we talk about the blessing, it's a big deal. We're not talking about who gets how many sheep you know, or, or anything. It's not just a, a few herd of cattle that's being discussed. It's the uh, issue of the Abrahamic covenant. And uh, what we're going to see again here is that uh, as, as you read or maybe hear stories about this or people teach on it, I think that uh, all the blame sometimes gets laid at the feet of Rebecca and Jacob. Uh, but we're going to see there's, there's plenty of sin to go around in this, in this passage. Well, let's look at the first four verses. Isaac rebels against God's prophetic plan. Now, it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Isaac his older son and said to him, my son. And he answered him, here I am. Then he said, behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow and go to the field and hunt game for me and make me savory food such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless you before I die. 
So uh, the first thing we note about this rebellion against God's prophetic plan, because who's he supposed to be blessing? Jacob, not Esau. Who is he favored all along? He's always favored Esau over Jacob. And he intends at this point, even though he knows what God said, even though he knows what he should be doing, he's just going to do, do the opposite. And um, we note that in order for this all to come down the way it should, uh, we've got to be blind, right? He's blind at this point. Verse 1, when Isaac was old, his eyes were so dim uh, that he could not see. And uh, I, I won't take you through all the math, but, you know, uh, Genesis gives us enough of account. Isaac's 40, right, when he's married. Uh, he prays for 20 years. He's 60 when the kids are born. So we can kind of track their ages. He's got an older brother, Ishmael, who's about 12 years older than him, uh, remember, from Hagar. Uh, so the bottom line is by the time we get to chapter uh, 25, verse 17, Ishmael dies at 137, so that makes Isaac uh, about 123. And uh, uh, the reason that that's all important, you think, I don't really care how old he is, but hang, hang on just a second. Uh, by the time Isaac dies in chapter 35, verse 28, he's 180. So he's blind for like 57 years. So it, it's not that he goes blind, I think I'm going to die. He lives 57 more years. So for 57 years, he's blind, and, uh, and this thing can never happen unless we would say he goes blind prematurely. So did God allow Isaac to go blind prematurely so this event can take place to make sure Jacob gets the blessing because that's who's supposed to get it? Because it ain't happening if Isaac can still see, right? I mean, you can see Jacob coming in, hey, I'm your son Esau, really? <laughs> get out of here. You know, I mean, you know, if he can see... There can be no deception. He has to be blind for the deception to, to really, really work for Rebecca to even cook up this, this whole idea. Forgive me if you haven't read ahead and don't know the story already. Hang in there with me. We'll, we'll catch up to that in a moment. My point is, God causes Isaac to go blind prematurely so that deception can take place, so that Jacob can be blessed, so that he can have 12 sons. So that one of them can be sold into slavery, into Egypt, Joseph, so he could get the pot of his house, so he could be thrown in a dungeon again, so he could interpret the dream of two of Pharaoh's officials, so that he could get to Pharaoh, so he could interpret his dream, so he could become the prime minister, so he can save all of Israel, which was 70 at that time. And they come to live with him, so that they could live in Goshen, protected, and, uh, and uh, grow to be a nation of two to three million people before Moses comes to deliver them to take them to the promised land so that Joshua could lead them into the land so that they could habitat in the land so that a man named David could become a king and one of his descendants would become Jesus of Nazareth who would go to the cross and die on that cross for our sins and rise again. Are we okay with Isaac being blind for a little while here? We're, I think, I'm, I'm okay with it. I don't, know if it, I don't know if he was thrilled about it at the time, but I'm okay with it and, uh, because it's the only way God's plan of redemption can keep rolling down through the years. Now, if you go blind in a couple of days, you can go, hallelujah, it must be God's plan. I'm okay with this because he's going to, you know, actually, we, we're probably not, but that's the reality, isn't it? You know, but the trouble is in the middle of the story, the beginning of the story, <laughs> we're just not real thrilled when God throws us a curveball. Uh, but he's, he's in control and he is sovereign over this whole thing. Man, and when Isaac finally sees it and finally gets it, he's going to be more than a little bit freaked out. But uh, you need to know, I think, his age to understand what's going on here. And that right from the get-go, even his blindness is part of God's plan. Why? Because he's in such rebellion against God. That doesn't mean anytime something goes terrible in our lives or different than we think it is. It's because of our rebellion. It might be, but it might just be because God has something he's trying to work out uh, for his good and his glory and the saving of other people. Second thing about this rebellion against God's prophetic plan is he intends to, uh, again, the obvious, bless the oldest instead of the youngest. Now, it's back in Genesis 25, verse 23, that we saw a few weeks ago, where Rebecca basically is pregnant and saying, why is this happening to me? <laughs> and uh, the, the Lord tells her prophetically, two nations are in your womb, Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. And, uh, and again, it's my opinion that she kind of mentions this to Isaac at that point in time. You know, it's interesting. There's some writers that you get to this whole thing about Isaac, 
in his rebellion against the Lord in God's known word. And he's like, well, maybe she never told him. I don't think so. She's like eight months pregnant, and these two kids are bopping around inside of her, driving her crazy, and God shows up and says something to her. I just think she might have mentioned it. I think she might have mentioned it like a lot. I think that every time he favored Esau through the whole time these kids are growing up, she might have mentioned it again. Yeah, I noticed you, you're partial there. But remember, it's this kid, Jacob, that gets the blessing. Just, I just thought I'd point that out and remember what God said. Um, I mean, this could be kind of very unusual, but I think from what we see in the text, it becomes pretty obvious that, uh, that Isaac is aware of this prophecy in what has been said. We might say he's painfully aware. But notice his passion uh, anyway in verse 4. He says to Esau, I make me savory food such as I love. Because I'm an old guy and I'm all about me, especially because I'm kind of blind and dependent upon all of you. Unfortunately, that's kind of where Isaac's at right now. And bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. This whole phrase of the idea that my soul may bless you is a, is a little bit over the top. It's just not saying, yeah, I just want to bless one of the kids. Uh, again, a, a Jewish writer from a Hebrew commentary says that Isaac summons from the very depths of his own soul all the vitality and energy at his command in order to invoke God's blessing upon his son, that my soul may bless, bless you. Now, who's, who's he blessing? Big Red, you know, the guy that's a living beer commercial. Remember, we, we talked about him in the New Testament commentary uh, about him. He's profane. Uh, he's a fornicator. I mean, he lives, he lives the lifestyle, the radical lifestyle. Uh, just to kind of uh, rub it in, he marries two Canaanite gals, right? And we read about that uh, uh, last week just to bug his, uh, his parents. You don't get too many more kids that are more rebellious than, than Esau. And uh, we mentioned that one writer kind of puts, as far as the profane people in the Bible, you've got Judas Iscariot and you got Esau right there, close, close second. This is the guy that Isaac's going, yeah, but he's my boy and I'm going to bless him. I don't care what God said. This is, this is kind of bad. Uh, and he's very passionate about uh, this idea of who it is that he's blessing. And uh, one writer said, he tosses a relational torch in the tent of his family. Because pretty much because he's going to do this, he's going to burn the whole thing down. Think about burning your bridges. This family is going to come apart and never be the same again because of Isaac's attitude and his going against God's word. Rebecca overhears Isaac's request. That's in verse 5 to 17. Now, Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to uh, bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me that I may eat. And bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, again, we've mentioned before when Moses repeats a conversation, uh, which is very, again, very Eastern to do that, to make sure we get it. But also, there's also other information sometimes thrown in. Now, before we read the emphasis, my soul wants to bless him. But notice what, as she overhears the conversation, apparently he also said, because I want to do it in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of Yahweh. He recognizes that when he stands over these kids and he pronounces a blessing, he anticipates God to speak through him, and we're going to see that that actually what, uh, is what happens. Verse 8, now therefore, my son... Obey my voice, says Rebekah again to Jacob, to what I command. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I, I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and, and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go get them for me. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were in, uh, with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the savory food and the bread, which she had prepared, into the hand of her son Jacob. So 
uh, Rebecca reveals her plan to Jacob, and of course, she's uh, overheard the whole thing. You don't have a lot of secrets when you live in a tent, pretty thin walls, and uh, so she overhears the <laughs> entire uh, conversation. And, uh, and again, there's four possibilities for Rebecca and what she's doing here. As I mentioned already, kind of fascinating to me what other people uh, take from this. One, one of them is that she, she doesn't tell Isaac the prophecy, and, and he's just kind of innocent. He's the oldest kid. He gets a blessing. You know, that's just the way it's going to go down. But that doesn't really jive with his reaction later when, when Esau shows up and said, you did what? <laughs> you gave what? Who was here already? He's going to be really freaked out, and he's not freaked out if he knows this already. I don't think that's a possibility. One writer said she uh, doesn't tell Isaac the prophecy to protect him from disobedience. But again, that doesn't match the reaction we see later. She fulfills God's plan without knowing it. No, she knows it very well. God spoke to her. It's so well spoken about that it carries on so that Moses makes sure he records it for us. The fourth possibility, she acted in faith, <clears throat> seeking to fulfill God's word. I think that's what she did. What she did was wrong. You know, she lied to her husband. She gets Jacob to lie to him and, and so forth. You know, she cooks up the whole scheme. Pretty clever. Uh, she's able to pull it off and everything. But, uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but I think she did this because, hey, God's word says this. He's supposed to get it. My husband's being an idiot. I'm going to kind of help the Lord out here, but I'm doing it in faith because I'm trying to I'm trying to do what God would want me to do. I think that's her her thinking. Was it wrong? Yeah. Uh, What is Jacob lies to him like three times? Is that wrong? Yeah. And you got Esau, you know, big red uh, living beer commercial. I mean, yeah, he's in sin anyway, so he's just over there. And then you got Isaac. I think among them, Isaac's the chiefest among sinners. Plenty of sin to go around, but I think most of it falls at the feet of uh, Isaac here. But here, she, well, in this case, chooses not to submit to her husband. And, uh, and how can she do that? Well, I think she thinks that she is doing God's will. Remember when the apostles were first arrested early on in the book of Acts preaching for preaching the gospel, they come in before the Sanhedrin, and uh, they're going to be beaten, told not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore. Peter, uh, it says of them in Acts 5.29, but Peter and the other apostles answered and says, we ought to obey God rather than man. I think that's what she thinks she's doing here. But again, that we would say the end never justifies the means. Uh, and we'll give some examples of that. But at the same time, there are those occasions when gals can pull this verse and say, yeah, I need to be in submission to my husband. Sure is a lot easier when he's a godly leader of our home. But I'm called to do that by Peter either way, as long as he doesn't tell me to to lie, to cheat, to steal, to do something that is obvious against God's word. In that case, then I can go to this verse and say, I ought to obey God rather than man. That's going to be the exception, gals. Uh, and if you, <laughs> if you <laughs> don't quote that verse to your husband, but if you choose that stance, make sure you've got a chapter and verse for why you're doing what you're doing. What she was doing, I think she thought she was doing the right thing, but uh, but again, the ends never justifies the means. Notice Jacob, he's reluctant to go along with the, with the deception. And uh, again, we're going to, as we go through, try to clear up a little bit of, uh, of Jacob's reputation, although he's, he's somebody to have fun with, certainly. But uh, verse 12, he says, perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be a deceiver. I don't want to be a deceiver. I might appear to be a deceiver. And I'll bring a curse on myself and not a, not a blessing. Blessing, and uh, I guess if you're from the south, it's a blessing, but if uh, otherwise, it's a blessing. But uh, he, uh, uh, she says, let your curse be on me, my son. So apparently he fears the consequences. He's not real confident they can pull the whole thing off, but apparently Rebecca says, uh, listen, I'm a better cook than your brother anyway. So I mean, the, the food part is no problem. It's just the disguise that we need to uh, come up with. And so she figures out that they can place the uh, the one robe uh, on, uh, on Jacob that's got the smell and, and everything of, uh, of Esau, you know, the same deodorant. No, the smell. And, uh, and they can, you know, do the disguise with, uh, uh, with the, the lamb's uh, wool on his wrist, on the back of the neck. I don't think Jacob stopped by the mall on the way to do this. You know, he probably looked, looked the sight, you know, having this stuff uh, uh, on him and everything. And again, this never, never happens if uh, Isaac is not uh, blind already. But both mother and son at this point 
<coughs> believe that the end justifies uh, the means. They believe that an unrighteous act was appropriate because it would aid in a righteous work of God. And that's never the case. It's never true. And uh, it's something that uh, has been around for a long time, that churches and ministries kind of struggle growth, uh, with missions organizations. How far can we go? Because after all, we're trying to win people to, to faith uh, in Christ. One of the recent phenomena is because of the quote, user-friendly churches, is to actually bring in non-Christians to play in the worship group, the bands, be the star performers in their dramas and so forth, uh, because after all, they want it to be at a high level and very professional, because after all, they're trying to reach people with the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. Of course, it kind of backfires when they see the, see the guy uh, in the play there at Easter and then see him in a parking lot drinking beer two weeks later or see him arrested, which has happened, uh, see him arrested uh, a year later for some kind of felony or whatever. Kind of, I thought that was the guy, and I, didn't we see him? And, you know, so it, it creates problems. Uh, the end never justifies the means. Like I say, this has been going on for a long time. It was even an issue at the turn of the century, turn of the last century, early 1900s. Uh, Griffin Thomas uh, writes this. Griffin Thomas has uh, uh, taught at Oxford for a period of time, uh, did a stint at Trinity in Canada, and then comes and helps uh, as one of the co-founders of Dallas Theological Seminary. And Griffin Thomas says that righteousness can never be laid aside, even though our object is yet more righteousness. In personal life, and home life, and church life, in endeavors to win men for Christ, in missionary enterprise, in social improvement, and in everything connected with the welfare of humanity, we must insist upon absolute righteousness, purity, and truth in our methods, or else we shall bring utter discredit on the cause of our Master and Lord. And, uh, and that's kind of what's going on here. It's been an issue in the church uh, throughout uh, its history, and it continues to be uh, today. Isaac rebels against God's prophetic plan. <clears throat> Rebecca makes her request. Jacob's going to go along with it. In verse 18 to 29, we note that Isaac doesn't, doesn't recognize Jacob, or does he? Verse 18, so he went to his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that, I have, uh, that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Whoa, because the Lord, your God, brought it to me. So now he brings God in on this uh, deception. Uh, Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son. Whether you're really my son Esau or not. We'll talk about why, why is he questioning this whole thing. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice. But the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? He said, I am. He said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's game, so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought, it, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing. And he blessed him and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field, which the Lord has blessed. Therefore may God give you of the dew of heaven of the fatness of the earth, of plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you and be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. It's quite the blessing. Keep in mind, he thinks he's talking to Esau, which, may, which makes it even in a sense more revolting because of everything that uh, is part of these four stanzas of this blessing. First, we note that he fails to recognize Jacob. He makes four attempts. He attempts to identify his son by voice and by touch. He attempts to identify him by oath. Are you really my son, Esau? He attempts to identify his son by eating the meal. Yeah, the food is right. And of course, then he calls him closer to kiss him 
and he attempts to identify him by, by smell. In the process, Jacob lies three times. His father says uh, to him, uh, am, uh, he says, I am Esau, your firstborn, in verse 19. And we don't know if he hesitated trying to get those words out of his mouth. But he lied when he named the Lord as the reason for his good hunting. In verse 20, how is it you found it so quickly, my son? And he said, because the Lord your God, notice it's all capitalized, Yahweh, because Yahweh, your God, has brought it to me, makes God an accomplice in the whole thing. Would Esau say that? No way. No way. Esau would have said, because I'm good at what I do. I'm a good hunter. That's why I got it. That's why I got it here. Let me tell you about how, I mean, this is Esau. This guy is profane, the Bible says. He would not say, oh, God was good to me. That's, that's not Esau. That's, that's not Big Red. Isaac, at that point, should have went, I'm in trouble here. Because it sure sounds like Jacob, and Esau would never say that. Yeah, it's, it's just interesting, you know, once, once he's going down this road, you know, against, it's like, God wants this, but I'm going to do it this other way anyway, and he can't stop me. And it's like, oh, man, that sounds like I could probably be caught here, but I'm going to do it anyway. It, it's just interesting. He, he had to know something was up. That's why he comes back in verse 24. Are you really my son Esau? Oh, I am. So he's, again, the, continues to ask because of the voice, and then also, I think, because of the name of God being used. Jacob's lie, third lie, complete. Isaac continues eating, guzzling his vintage wine, and, uh, and then gives the blessing. And in it, uh, again, Isaac's failure to recognize Jacob leads to the blessing. It's four stanzas, uh, uh, stanza one and two speak of productivity. Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. We're going to find that Jacob's life is blessed. It's just This guy will go to Padan Aram and meet uh, Laban, who is really a schemer and, uh, and everything. We mentioned that he was the uh, Marty, Marty Morduck of the, uh, Marduk of the uh, Middle East there. This guy's like a used car salesman. And, uh, and we've got introduced to him a little bit early when the uh, servant goes to get uh, Rebecca, remember, uh, and, uh, and we'll, we'll get to know more about him. But he goes to that guy who rips everybody off, and Jacob comes back wealthy. And it isn't because he's a good shepherd. It's because the Lord blessed him. And, and we're going to see that. What, what Isaac pronounces upon him, God, he is speaking in, in, uh, on behalf of God. And, uh, and it does come to pass. Uh, the second stanza... Also productivity, therefore my God, uh, may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain uh, and wine. And uh, these may not be the, the words that you would choose to uh, pronounce a blessing on your, your son today, but it was a blessing. Uh, dew is a favorite Hebrew metaphor for God's goodness, providing abundance, and so forth. And we see it throughout uh, uh, Scripture in the Old Testament. Psalm 133 is a classic Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together uh, in unity. How good is it? What is it compared to? Uh, it's like precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of the garments, which, uh, you know, again, the priest is anointed with the anointed oil. In the New Testament, we'd see that as a, as a, also as a metaphor for the Holy Spirit, the oil of the Spirit coming uh, upon him. And notice the purpose for it or what it's likened to is that he would be productive and be fruitful, even that we might be by the power of God's spirit. But here's the, the dew, verse 3. What, what is it like also? It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So dew, again, uh, this is a metaphor for, for blessing, fatness, and plenty part of the uh, prosperity that would be upon his son. Productivity. Third stand, position over others. Verse 29, let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. This is about as in your face as you can get for what, uh, was, what was supposed to be happening here. That's what's supposed to be said to Jacob and not Esau. So utterly rejecting this, uh, this word uh, from God and, uh, and yet at the same time, this is Jacob, and all of this does come to pass. 
<clears throat> Esau becomes the Edomites, present-day Jordan. And uh, uh, what happens is that uh, eventually, of course, as I mentioned, the children of Israel do go into to Egypt where they are able to multiply and prosper, protected. Because if they remained in Canaan and they started to grow, they got only 70 people, they're not a threat to anybody. If they start kind of growing, they get to be a couple of thousand, then all the other tribes around go, oh, that's a little concerned. I think we better go kill all of them uh, be, because they would not allow someone else to grow more powerful and strong. God moves them to Egypt in Goshen, and they go to be, grow to be two to three million people. And then God delivers them out, brings them into the land. We mentioned that eventually David would be born. From the time David becomes king, then he is able to bring peace and subjugate the nations around him, including Jordan, including the Edomites. From the time of Ju uh, they become a vassal state of Israel, from David to Jehoshaphat. It happens once again in the second temple era when Ezra comes back, get another short rise to power, and uh, in present-day Jordan or the Edomites uh, become subjected to Israel once again. It's very interesting in the day that we live now, it's, uh, it's very much the same way. Uh, the people of Jordan wouldn't uh, probably go along with it, but that's just the reality. Uh, they have no economy. They have no oil. <laughs> they just got sand in, uh, in Jordan. And, uh, and as a result, they have no jobs. They have super high unemployment. So their jobs are primarily in Israel. And Israel has a good relationship with them. They open the border. People flood across the border every day, work their jobs, and then they go back into Jordan again. The rest of the population, if they want a job, they basically get on a plane and they go to the Gulf region where they work as domestics. Uh, maids, housekeepers, gardeners, and that kind of thing. The, the, the Edomites, the people of, uh, of Jordan. It was interesting during the first Persian Gulf War when uh, Saddam Hussein is about to be ready to launch his scud attacks against Israel. Jordan, like other Islamic nations, were putting up posters, oh yeah, we support Saddam Hussein and so forth. And Israel said, okay, I think we'll probably close our border for a little while and uh, let your unemployment go to about 25%. And, and then they said, uh, okay, we probably won't be supporting him anymore. And uh, okay, I think we can open that border again. But ev even today, they're in to some degree uh, uh, in subjection to, uh, to Israel. But what, uh, what is prophesied here in this blessing does, in fact, come to, come to, uh, to play. There's an interesting uh, line in Obadiah. Obadiah prophesies against the Edomites because of the way they treated Israel coming out of Egypt. Egypt, uh, under Moses, they wanted to come up through Jordan to get into Israel, and the uh, Edomites would not allow them to, to do that. And um, uh, Obadiah says this about them, The pride of your heart has deceived you, you dwell in the clefts of the rock whose habitation is high. Uh, you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, for there I will bring you down, says the Lord. Now, there's a little shot of not a Hollywood soundstage. That's actually uh, current day Petra. And the Edomites were the cliff dwellers who created these places and lived there and uh, We've talked on other occasions about how narrow the passageway was into these rock cities. Therefore, they were very easy to defend against enemies. And they were very prideful about it. And through Obadiah, and his whole prophecy is against these guys, he says, uh, yeah, it looks really good, but it's not really going to help you because God's going to bring you down. And, uh, and that's what we see happening. Uh, and again, going along with what's in the third stanza. The fourth stanza is a promised protection. Cursed be everyone who curses you. Blessed be those who bless you. So again, a reiteration of at least a portion of the Abrahamic covenant. And of course, this, he's thinking this is to Esau. <laughs> Esau, the kid that's a fornicator and profane and doesn't care about his birthright and is just this radical kid. He's going to say this blessing to, to him. I think that would have been a big mistake. Uh, Isaac here thinks at this point that he's, in a sense, he showed God. God said, this is what's going to happen. And he says, I'll show him. So he's, he's in for a little bit of a shock here now uh, as we get to verse 30. The deception is revealed. Now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob. Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. 
He also made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I'm your son, your firstborn son, Esau. Now, if you're a Bible underliner, verse 33, then Isaac trembled exceedingly. I have a little anxiety attack here uh, at, this, at this point. There's a little, little reality check going on and said, who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I've blessed him. And then another important verse we'll talk about there, and indeed he shall be blessed. There's a realization right, right in there in Isaac's mind that, well, I, God's word is going to come to pass. It has come to pass. Verse 34, when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. Said to his father, bless me, me also, O my father. But he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, uh, is he not rightly named Jacob? Now again, uh, NIV will get a, uh, they'll use a word like uh, deceiver or cheater, uh, which is the idea. Esau is changing the name of Jacob here. For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, uh, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed, I have made him your master. And all of his brethren I have given to, um, uh, all of his brethren I have given to him as servants with grain and wine, and I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept as he gives this blessing. Then Isaac, his father, answered and, uh, and said to, uh, to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above, but your sword, uh, uh, by your sword you shall live. You're going to be a violent man. That's how you're going to live your life. And you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass when you become restless, that you shall break his yoke from your neck. So God's sovereign will is revealed to Isaac. And again, that verse 33 is very key in all of this. Who's going to be blessed? Jacob. Who did God say would be blessed? Jacob. Why is Isaac trembling? The same reason that he could keep digging more wells all the time. Because God was faithful and God was with him. And that realization has just come back to him again. God is faithful to his word, and God is with him right there. God was with him as he spoke those words of blessing. He thought to Esau, though he had to be questioning in his own mind, and it does turn out to be Jacob uh, indeed. God is with him, and God is sovereign. Uh, we see Isaac's submission in verse 33. When I, uh, Esau is crying out, well, bless me. Don't you have more than one blessing? No, I blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. Now, it was um, at least what we know archaeologically from the custom of the day in that part of the world that when a father did pronounce a blessing, and this was a very common thing to do, that he could not take it back, that it was like a legal, a legal transaction in that sense. But there's a little more to that than's going on because he's still going to uh, bless Esau, but he still says to him, and you are going to have to serve him because that's what God says. So there's, in a sense, in this little moment, there's a bit of repentance in the heart of, uh, of Isaac. Uh, he realizes that he's blown it. God is still sovereign. God is going to make it happen. I can't change this. And no, I can't change it because this is what God is doing. Donald Barnhouse uh, put it this way. Before a great work of grace, there must be a great earthquake. Isaac had put uh, his personal love of Esau ahead of the will of God. Down came his idol. Can uh, your relationship with other people become an idol? Yeah. In the edifice, a, a willful love collapsed before the shaking power that took hold of him. The arrogant pride, which had slyly pl uh, planned to thwart God, toppled to the ground, broken beyond repair. When Isaac trembled exceedingly, all his desires were shattered. Now again, commentary from the New Testament. The Bible is a good commentary on the Bible. And what it says about Isaac is very interesting in, in, verse, uh, in that Hall of Fame of Faith, chapter 11. It says there in verse 20, By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. 
You know, when you just read the first half of the thing, you think, I don't really think that's by faith. I think he's uh, pretty much being tricked there. So how, how is it by faith? I think it's because of verse 33. Because he is shaken up and realizes that God's will has been done. I couldn't thwart God's plan. God said it's going to happen. It's going to happen. There's nothing I can do about it. I just got to, I need to submit to it and go along with it. There's some repentance there in that little verse, verse 33. So as he pronounces the blessing, it's by faith. Uh, as, he, as he goes ahead and says what he does to Esau. Very, very interesting. Uh, the second thing about the request is that, of course, Esau wants to know if he can receive any kind of blessing, and we get that in verse 36, where Esau then uh, begins to say, is he not rightly named Jacob or the cheat because he surplanted me? He's deceived me. He's tricked me these, uh, these two times. <clears throat> is that what happened? Is that what happened? Jacob, uh, Esau comes in from the field, and uh, remember Jacob's there. He just won the Iron Chef Award, and he's making his special lentil stew. And he says to him, uh, do you want some of this? He goes, yeah. Will you give me your birthright? Yeah. I don't care about it. Just give me something to eat. I don't see the deception there. He doesn't say, hey, I'll give you something to eat, and what I want, I'll tell you later. And then after he eats, what I want is your birthright. Now, that would be deception. He doesn't deceive him. Is Esau lying? Esau is lying. Esau is lying about his name. His, his name is uh, heel catcher, but I'm going to call him cheater from now on. So the, the idea of Jacob being dirty, sneaky thief really comes from Esau, from Big Red, <laughs> the living bear commercial. I don't know if I can keep calling him that or not, now knowing the, uh, the, the source of it. Uh, but... Uh, uh, in Hebrews, again, uh, we read it a few weeks ago, verse uh, uh, 15 of chapter 12, this commentary on what we just read. Uh, says, again, looking carefully, lest any fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, causing trouble, and by this uh, many uh, become defiled. So as believers, be careful. Uh, don't let anyone miss the grace of God, and don't let any bitter root come up in your heart that's going to cause you trouble and defile many people around you, because that's like who? That's like Esau. Esau had a bitterness in his heart towards his brother that was there all along, Seemed maybe even against his mother. He doesn't seem to very, be very close with her at all, pretty much. He's just a, a guy that lived for himself to do his own, his own thing. He's kind of what we call the man-child <laughs> of today. Maybe that's not a new phenomenon. Uh, maybe that's uh, been around for, uh, for a while, this self-centered uh, existence. Uh, so there's a warning about bitterness. Verse 16, lest there be any, uh, again, the description of Esau, a fornicator or a profane person, again, like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Was he tricked or deceived? No, he, he just sold it. He didn't care about it. For you know that afterwards, what we just read, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. Who was he rejected by? Isaac. Because Isaac says, no, God says this. I'm, I'm kind of blowing it here, but I'm going with God at this point. That's, that's the turning point of verse 33. He was rejected. He was rejected by, by uh, Esau, or by Isaac. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. And we just talked about him weeping and crying. But no change of heart. You know, no change, no repentance. Paul talks about that there's a, a godly sorrow that leads to repentance, that brings salvation, uh, and, uh, but there's also a worldly sorrow that brings death. And uh, Esau's got the worldly sorrow. He's sorry for how it turned out, but not sorry about his own life and his relationship with the Lord. Isaac certainly would agree with the, uh, the words of Job at this point. I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you or thwarted. God's going to have his way. And uh, all the th everything he says prophetically is going to come down. It's going to, to happen. Let's look at the, the um, kind of the repercussions here. Uh, Jacob will not be able to remain in the land, verses 41 to 46. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning from my father are at hand, and then I will kill my brother Jacob. Nice guy. Uh, in the words of Esau, uh, her older son, we're told to Rebekah, so she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to, 
to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him. <laughs> She's like, what you did? <laughs> I think it was Rebecca's idea. Uh, then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? Because if Esau kills him, they're going to enact a little capital punishment on, on Esau. She'll lose them both in the same day. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Haith. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Haith, uh, like these two, or the daughters uh, of the land, what good will my life be to me? And remember, Esau, um, just to kind of rub it in a little bit, even though he knew better, he marries two gals that were Canaanites, so the daughters of the Hittites. They, and uh, that's what she makes reference to here. Uh, so we've just two things. Jacob will, again, not be able to remain in the land because Esau is going to kill him. Uh, apparently, that's not an empty threat. You know, I mean, they're like, uh, hey, you know, just kind of hang out over here uh, just for a few days. I'm sure this will all cool down. No, she goes, I think you better leave. And like, uh, right now is a really good time because uh, he, he, he will kill you. Uh, and then Rebecca realizes, again, the only thing she can do is send him away. And uh, he goes to, to Padam Aram. How long has he gone? A few days? 20 years. She never sees him again. I mean, this, this whole thing, there's plenty of sin to go around. But man, when Isaac just goes, I am not going to do what God tells me to do. <laughs> like, uh, you know, we mentioned earlier, it was like he just took a torch and threw it into the tent of his family. And it all went up in flames. Two boys come back together at, uh, at Isaac's death. They both part, partake in his burial. You know, we'll see the story of Jacob uh, coming back into the land with all this wealth, uh, still very concerned 20 years later whether his brother would kill him or not. Uh, his mother dies before he ever makes it back again as far as, uh, as, far as we know. Real life story. Everyone's sent. No one's good. Uh, Rebecca and Jacob thought God needed help. Uh, Esau was the favor, but he disregarded God's word, despised the promises. We would say everyone in the family sought the blessing of God without bending the knee to God. Jacob comes around with a little submission there uh, at the end. But uh, uh, again, it's, uh, it's a sad story uh, and with a real beauty to it. And the beauty in this story is that uh, God is sovereign. And his word is going to happen. And he's good for his promises. And if he says this is going to happen, it's going to happen. And when we go along with his word, there's, there's a, a blessing in our lives. And when we don't go along with his word, well, let's read what Paul says about that in 2 Timothy 2.11. He says, this is a faithful saying. He's got a few of them, and it's like, check this out. This is like super important. It's believed that this was a hymn of the early church, actually. Uh, 2 Timothy uh, 2.11. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. So the resurrection of believers uh, is guaranteed. We're going to die in Christ. We're going to be with him for all eternity. Verse 12, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. And so again, the promise that all believers were going to die, we're going to be with the Lord forever. We're going to return with the Lord and we'll rule and reign with him in his millennial kingdom and as we go into all eternity. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Uh, people, everybody has the opportunity. No one will be with the Lord if they've denied him. Our salvation is predicated upon our acceptance of Jesus Christ and his death for our sins on the cross or our rejection uh, of his, uh, his uh, good gift for us. So you've got the, you know, if this is this, then this is this. And of course, that uh, if in the Greek is uh, if and it is so, or we would say since, uh, since he died for us, uh, since we endure, uh, and then verse 13, or since, <laughs> or if, it's since, since we are faithless, it's, we're, it's all over for us. No, he remains faithful. He can't deny himself. That's, that's the beauty in, in all this. The re reliability of God is greater than our performance because uh, you know if you follow it it's like well he does this he does this he does this he does this and you get to that part and Paul goes no this part's different uh, even when you're faithless 
he's still going to be faithful to you, like in this story, because God can't deny himself. Was Isaac doing what he should have been doing? No. Nah. Was Rebecca? No. Nah. Was Jacob? And then <laughs> Esau's a whole other story. Uh, God's plan going to still come down? God going to be faithful? Yeah. Yeah, he's still going to be faithful. And uh, Jacob's still going to be the guy. And he's going to have his ups and downs. And he's going to have to have a little encounter with God there at the, uh, uh, at the river Jacob. Jacob on his way back into town. Get his hip disjointed a little bit as he wrestles with God all night until he can finally say, I give up. Would you just bless me? And uh, it's, all, it's all awaiting him. God will be faithful to his word. And uh, even when they manipulate and fight against it, but God will prevail, and we can be really glad of that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that um, truly there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, that our relationship with you is based on what you've done on our behalf, and our response to you is to love you, is to worship you, is to desire to spend time with you, and uh, hear what you want to say to us from your word, because after all, you, you died for us, and, and, you, and you love us. Lord, I, um, uh, I'm just reminded of the words of Ezekiel that we were studying on Wednesday night, that at the rejection of your people, it, it crushed your heart. Lord, you so desire to have that response from us to uh, accept your love and your grace and your mercy, and when people reject it, it crushes your heart. Lord, may we draw closer to that understanding and what it is to walk with you and trust you. And, and uh, we would agree with the Apostle Paul, since we're faithless, uh, nobody here is, is perfect. None of us have walked on water this week. We're just doing the best we can living our lives, Lord. But help us keep our eye on you and know that whatever else is going on, you will be faithful to us. Help us uh, remember the lessons of Isaac that... Lord, every time there was contention and hostility, you moved them on and then you provided. Probably something even better. You just kept doing it and proving yourself to be faithful over and over again. Lord, so I pray that we could learn these lessons. We could remember them. We could apply them to our hearts. And when the enemy comes, Lord, to bring doubt and fear, we would fall back on your word and what we know is true. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we all stand together?